Welcome to the new Europe Studios and Cafe. I'm here today with Nicola Mazzati from Cinematech, which is the Belgian uh, film archive. Uh, Mr. Mazzati has teamed up with 26 others, including 21 other national archives, to preserve and to present films from World War I, which happened 100 years ago, and whose effects we all feel today in Europe. Now, uh, Nicola, how did this project start? Well, the, the, first of all, we kind of knew 2014 was coming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, one of the challenges we all have is that films which are on film, they cannot, basically cannot be seen anymore. All theatres are now digital in Belgium, but also in most Europe. So this is stuff that unless we, we, we turn them into some digital form or digital files, they cannot be accessed. Not to mention the fact that everybody looks at images on YouTube or other platforms. Mm -hmm. There was also the need to provide historians, scholars and the general public to the images of World War One. So we made a proposal, we got the funding from the uh, from a European program and we digitized basically, I'm not saying everything, but presumably what, 80% of what exists about the war as, mm -hmm. as long uh, for what um, moving images are concerned across 20 countries, so you actually can see the same battle from both sides. Mm -hmm. And the project came to, to, to an end now, it finished, uh, 5,600 films were digitized. So it's quite a lot of material and of course not much was filmed during World War I compared, for example, to World War II. Yeah. So we have a long way to go. What I've noticed from looking through the archives, and all of these are available on europeangateway.eu. Yeah. And one of the things is we've all seen aspects and old footage of the First World War, but what this project is doing is what uh, Mr. Mazzanti has just mentioned is it's enabling us to see footage from all sorts of different sides and perspectives that we may not have done before. I mean, when you're looking through all of these uh, archives, there must have been some things that really changed how you saw the war. Did it? Uh, Have there been yeah. any surprises? Well, I think the, the, the most interesting thing, apart from the factual facts, like images of this area bombed or this town destroyed, it's really that World War I is when the whole rhetoric and the whole propaganda, use of, of propagandistic use of film came about. Before, of course, there was hardly any film. And that the first time that film progressively along the war, so 1914 was not used so heavily, but then later on you see that the content becomes more and more propagandistic with extremely interesting um, and creative views of images. For example, there's a beautiful story of a very short documentary about uh, the glory of German U-boat, so submarines, mm -hmm. And this is a German film, a propaganda for the U-boats. And then this film was captured by the English, the British, and they used the same images to show how beastly the, summer, the German submarines were. So they just changed the editing, changed the intertitles, and the same images, more or less. In one case, tell the story of a, of a brave crew, and on the other hand, they teach with the same images the story of a cruel killers of... Um, innocent ships crossing the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely modern in a way. And of course it shows also the reality of the war, which is also one of the reasons why we do mostly show documentaries or non-fiction, uh, images from the front and so on, but we also include uh, um, uh, fiction films. Yeah. Because during and after the war, immediately after the war, of course, Films were produced about the concept, the reasons, and what happened to the war. And then it's an all other story. So it's the story about how Europe came out of the war, 
building new, the new uh, rhetoric and the new ideology of the peace, of the we are all friends, there is no war, the new era of peace will start, as uh, we all know, it lasted 20 years. Mm -hmm. And um, out of these films and archives that, that you've got and these visions, do you see any kind of current, f any themes developing out there? Or uh, you mean from this, well, the, uh, the concept was that we wanted to give everybody, and by everybody I mean everybody, so anybody can go on um, European Film Gateway or on Europeana, or in many cases, like in our cases, on our YouTube channel, and watch whatever they want. There is no paying fees, there is no, and particularly it's almost everything we have. So it's not only a larger selection, it's almost everything. In our case, for example, in Belgium, we digitize everything. Yeah. So it's not about selecting, it's not about creating a new discourse on top of a discourse, it's about letting people see, watch, and use the material. So the material are being used in exhibitions, in other websites, they are embedded everywhere, uh, and then people keep, keep watching them just for the, for the pleasure of, of, of watching them. And Sometimes we still receive letters of people saying, well, in that scene my grandfather was, or I, I was on that battle, or was actually in the film. Mm. So, in a way, we touch from the museum who wants to use the images in a certain context to the individual citizen who had a grandfather like me, who fought the war and in some cases died there. I mean, one of the things that about Belgium is just how much blood has been yeah. shed on its soil. So these films for the people here in Belgium must have a, a particular poignancy. Absolutely. The, the thing, of course, is that uh, because of that, there are not many images actually shot in Belgium by the Belgians because there was very little going on in Belgium apart from bloodshed and, 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 and bombing everywhere. So we have a significant... We, we have everything that is, was shot at the time, but we don't really... It's not much, that's what I'm saying. But of course there are surprising images uh, because there is the front. But for example, I remember very well because I was working in Italy at the time, there is this frightening documentary, series of documentary actually about the soldiers who come back from the front and then they are invalid, they, they miss a, a limb or an arm and it's horrible. And this was 1918-2019. These are things that come out and they give you a completely different uh, look, because it's not about the trenches, is, is that the people actually come back from the trenches and then the troubles start. Mm. So it, it's a lot of different um, material that can be approached in, in, in very different ways. Yeah. The way towns change, the way they were bombed and destroyed, of course, um, or simply the way people lived. Um, so it's, um, I think it's, I think what I particularly like is that there is everything. And then we have to use this raw material in order to make the history, based on actual documents. Most of the documents were made at the time. I mean, when we, when we look back to that time also, filming these events and some of the events that it must have been phenomenally difficult, certainly compared to today's digital technology and minicams. I mean, are any, did, did any of the people who may shot some of the footage, become some of the pioneers of cinema, like... Yeah, as I said, th this is the moment, the time when cinema discovers that is extremely powerful propaganda uh, medium can be used as such. Um, because something was done in the Boer War, something was done in before, but not really much. So it's really now that they start realizing this is a uh, great um, instrument, very popular. The, the, the top grossing film in 1916 in the UK was actually a very long documentary about the Battle of the Somme. The film still exists, restored by the Imperial War Museum, and, um, uh, and that was the film everybody wanted to watch because, of course, they, they, they let's not forget there was no television or radio, so you had to, that was the only images you could get from the front. Of course it was the beginning, so, for, and in many cases it was forbidden to shoot on the front. Mm -hmm. So, unlikely Second World War, where the cameramen were often in front of the front, 
So yeah. they, w they would mm -hmm. be killed and shot because they were shooting in the middle of the battle. This is not the case with World War I. They were f further back, so the view is much uh, further away from the, the, the carnage of the trenches mm -hmm. because it's still growing and they still have to understand that in order to hit the public very strong, you, you don't need to see a poof poof of a bombing, but you need to actually see the blood. But they were also scared that seeing too much would then mm -hmm. f have the opposite reaction from the audience. They would not want to stay at war. So it was it's really a, a process of understanding how you can use effectively this propaganda tool. And as I say, it changes along the years. If you look at works of mm -hmm. films from 14 to 18, you see that things change. Okay. Uh, so it seems very uh, important that perhaps those of us in the media should also be having a look at these images and see how we've been manipulated ourselves. Over it's the uh, well, um, I think that uh, one, I think that in general, I mean, apart from the World War One, which is extremely interesting uh, subject, of course, mm -hmm. I think there is a general problem that um, a, a serious lack of media liter literacy in Europe mm -hmm. translation. We don't teach students and kids about media, particularly moving images, leave them completely open to any manipulation because they don't understand the language. They don't understand the trick of editing an image of somebody with a gun and then somebody covered in blood has a clear message. Yeah. Even if the two things happen 20 kilometers away, one from the other, and are unrelated, but the fact they are spliced together impact you in a way. So. The sad thing is that we don't teach film, we don't teach cinema, we don't teach television in our basic education. And so mm -hmm. our kids, they are completely unprepared. Okay. And, and this material actually, in a way, shows how this propagandistic approach of using images came to be. And in a way, also, how we are still unprepared for it. Of course, not, not those who study these kind of things, but... We are not really thinking about how this... I mean, that, that's a very interesting point because at one level, there's simply the, the recording and the preserving of, of the record. But then there's this other level that you're talking about, about explaining it and explaining the context of it. You know, how can we get a bit more of that in? Because we've all seen the footage or seen footage from World War I but we don't necessarily know what it means. But this is in fact a part of, the, I mean, the whole project was really to, as I said, to provide the raw material. Then of course the work must be done with it. And this is not part of this project, but this is done by all sorts of other websites and publications and DVDs and whatever, who will come out in the different countries and who will actually use this material in order to explain how it happened or how it did not happen. Because of course, in many cases, we see images that never happened. That's what propaganda is about, of course, telling a story that, that never took place, uh, or at least not that way. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is, um, this is what, uh, what it's all about. And also, let's not forget that documentary images are never true, by definition. A documentary is never true. Docu a documentary is a manipulation of, of what happens in order to tell a certain story or, or a certain message. It's always been like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but of course you, but then behind it, so there is a, 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 a thinking about how people saw the war, how they were made to see the war, and also behind all of that, of course there are images that are objectively true, so you get a glimpse of, together with other things, literature, with, with journalistic photos and so on, of the horror of World War I, and then of all the, all the rest. And this is, of course, the tip of the iceberg. As I said, this is a period where not much was shot. But imagine the 30s, imagine the, the in-between war period, imagine what is World War II, and even after the war. The 50s, the Marshall Plan, and, and, and so on, the fall of the wall. So we're talking about a huge... Uh, we're talking about the memory of European memory in the last 100 years. I mean, this is why we, we wanted to speak with you about this, because you know, the memory and historical memory is so important. 
And as you can see, as you're explaining, it can be so easily manipulated. Yeah. But with uh, 21 different archives, I mean, that must take quite some organisation to get yeah. 26 kind of national bodies to all feel European. How, how difficult was it to get enthusiasm for the project? No, it was not difficult. I mean, the, the, on the contrary, I mean, the, the, first of all, the, the film archives are not many. They are like, on average, maybe two per country, something mm -hmm. like that. Because some countries, like, they have ten, so of course this. Uh, so it's a fairly small group of institutions. We, um, uh, we collaborate on a regular basis. We have an association, a European association. So we work constantly. We have done other projects before. So it was fairly uncomplicated. And I think one of the reasons why we got funded is because they knew we would deliver. Okay. So it's a <laughs> And of I mean, course, there is a nightmarish of, of work because, of course, sometimes you have the same film with different titles in different languages. I mean, there, there was a great deal of coordination, but the very end was fairly smooth in the, in the result in getting what we wanted to get. And, I mean, have you had any feedback from, say, like professional academics, historians about the work that you've done yet? They are, I mean, there is a, a, quite an impressive number of enthusiasm, a deal of enthusiasm a, a, about it because it's the first time that everything is available. Mm. Because you, you must realize that bef until this, uh, in order to see the Battle of the Sun, you have to travel to London. In order to see uh, a certain front from both sides, you have mm -hmm. to go to Paris and then to Berlin. This is the first time that you click on the mouse and you can see the same situation from both sides. So it is. It shows what can be done. Yeah. Now, is there a political and also will for for the other next years to continue with the rest of the iceberg? If this is the tip, then there is the rest of the iceberg. Well, yes, and of course the rec rest of the iceberg contains the Second World War, which may be more exactly. More Not difficult. more material. That's a nightmare. This is only. I mean, it's, it's not it's seven, I think it's seven or eight hundred hours. I mean, uh, yeah. Second World War is eight hundred hours per country. So, I mean, it's huge. <laughs> and of course, it's more contentious, it's more complicated. Is um, Because that will also bring in rights where presumably copyright doesn't really there is apply. Copyright problem, of course. Uh, and uh, so the fact that even, even if we stay in the area of scientific research, as we know, it's a tricky issue. Yeah. Well, it's not tricky. There is no exception whatsoever so for that. So making available this material might be problematic, but also just the sheer quantity. On the other hand, this is what we are. I mean, if we want to know or to teach or to show or anything about what's Europe and who we are, I mean, there is no other way. No. The alternative is just forget about it. And, and it's funny because in these days I, I was listening, I think it was BBC, they talked a lot about teaching about the Holocaust. Mm, and yes. I don't know, I forgot why there was a... Well, of course there is the, 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 the Holocaust Day, I mean. So the word, and I, heard a, I listened to a couple of discussions on BBC World uh, debates and I realized that they were discussing how to teach Holocaust to the kids. And I thought, well, just show them what it was. We have all those films. Oops, they are not digitized. Oops, we cannot show them. Oops, we are bringing up a generation who will not see what Holocaust was. And I think this is, is a scary thought. I think you're 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 very very right. It's a kind of um, scary thought, particularly going into yeah because uh, I mean, European elections in a few months. Yes, and especially when there are people sitting in the European exactly. Parliament who deny that. Happens. Exactly. I don't want to. This is this is a, a discussion that really. No, no, no. That's another discussion. Um, what I, what I want to do is just just to finish up with you, is to really ask you about the process of of archiving, and about the preservation. You're saying you're you're, you're digitising them. Now, many people might think, oh, these films are digitalized, they're safe now forever. Are they? Yeah, no. Well, there was a very nice, uh, uh, one of the very first uh, studies about digital, preserving digital data, the title was Five Years or Forever, Whichever Comes First. 
which means that we have no clue how long this material lasts. Yeah. Reality is that today to preserve this material means to keep the original film, because this we know how and how long it will last, together with keeping these files and this material uh, that we produce now, and uh, together with the new films, which are all digital anyway. So it's, a, uh, it's getting bigger problem uh, mm -hmm. that archive have been doing for approximately 80 years. We are 75 years old, there are a couple of archives a bit older, let's say 80 years. Now things are changing and the urgency is that we need to keep the past and the present because ultimately, end of the day, what the film archive, on an archive, all sorts of archives are, are there for the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our job is not the past, our job is the future. Our job is my 13-year-old kid, what he will be able to watch 20 years down the line, and his kids. So it's getting more complicated, it's getting some sense of urgency, and I don't feel the sense of urgency is felt enough outside our little world. So is, is there anything that, that Europe can do to, to help that? Because Europe should realize that it is a epochal change. So the transition to digital for film business, yeah. not just the archive, but for the film industry is an epochal change. And we are on the verge of losing uh, the past 120 years of images, which is, would be unpleasant. Because, I mean, you know this more, far more than I, but we're having real problems in the way that film has been kept and stored, and it's, uh, it's got a lifespan the way that we've done it. It's so a far. checkered situation. I mean, there are countries which in better conditions are not so easy, but so there is a lot of material. A lot has been lost, but a lot is there. And the problem is that um, unless this is on some sort of digital platform, this is never going to be seen. So actually, as I referred to Shoah, if we have Holocaust images that are not available anywhere but on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, in my office, what's the point? It doesn't lead anywhere. So either this material is made available or is just as good as dead. It's not physically dead, it's there, but it cannot be watched. So it's kind of, that's the challenge we have in the next, let's say, 10 years. And I think that Europe as a whole should take a lead in... Um, because it's a European issue, it's not a national issue. I don't think so. That's right. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And talking to you. And I think as, as has been explained, that, that this is the form of preserving a European memory, a memory of who we are, how we got here, and the importance of the archives really can be summed up in, in the old saying, is those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat it. Exactly. We've been having an archive of one aspect of European history that should never be repeated. Let's hope we can have more effort put into preserving our common European memory, no matter how difficult it has been. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me.